Welcome to Novel Spotlight, the podcast where published fiction writers are interviewed to gather their insights and writing lessons so we can use them to make ourselves better and more effective writers. There are just three things I ask of you, if appropriate to you and your experience. Please subscribe, please click on the like button, and please share this program link with any family members, friends, or colleagues who might be interested or benefit from the content. Now, on with our program. I noticed from your bio that you were born in Gainesville, Florida, and here you are, 12 years old, and your parents do what parents do sometimes, pick up their children and move them, but you were only 12, and you hated leaving your friends and the beaches of Florida. There you are in the middle of Montana, and what happened when you were in Montana? So... Yeah, so I, my dad and mom just decided they wanted to move to Montana, even though my dad had a really pretty fabulous job at the University of Florida as chief of neuropathology there. And um, he just decided that he wanted to be in the mountains, and so did my mom. And they, he left that good job and opened a private practice in neurology. In the, back then, it was a very small town. Uh, in the Flathead Valley called Kalispell. And now there's several towns around where I live. A lot of them have been kind of discovered and, you know, it's the property prices are through the roof and it's, you know, it's all the Hollywood stars are moving there. Yeah. And and I mean, this phenomenon has been happening now for probably, I would say the past 20 years, but um, it's, it really exploded here the last couple of years with COVID and everything. And, um, yeah, when you moved there, you were crestfallen, but lo and behold, it didn't work out quite the way you thought it would. It was much better, right? Yeah, so Glacier National Park is only about 20 minutes away, and back in those days, there was hardly anybody that visited Glacier. Now now we're just bombarded in the summer, and you need reservations to get in, but back then, and for a very long time, up until just a few years ago, it was like our own private playground, really. I mean, we'd go in there and park anywhere, um, never any traffic, uh, hike anywhere, you know, no problems at all, getting backcountry permits into camping sites or just, you know, getting on the trails for the day. And um, I just kind of fell in love with that whole area. And it was a really great addition to my life, just Montana in general, everybody was very, very nice. And, you know, I was so afraid to leave my friends at that age and leave the beaches and start somewhere new at, you know, at that kind of very impressionable age. And um, I, I kind of loved it. I also, in retrospect, look back at it and think, you know, it was a good age to do that for me, because I actually learned that I was capable of doing that, of making new friends and being strong and just, you know, getting out there and doing that. And so, and then, you know, discovering the wild was uh, just a huge plus. And years later, when I decided that I wanted to write a crime fiction novel, I didn't know quite where to set it. I was kind of confused by I mean, I'd never written a crime fiction novel. I was, I mean, we're I'm flash forwarding here to about my mid forties when I decided I would write, you know, dive into this crime fiction thing. And the reason I decided I wanted to write crime fiction is because I wanted to write what I love to read. And that happens to be that. And I did try and write a couple novels in my younger years. Um, You know, after college in my mid to late twenties. And I just wrote some, I wrote two I consider them practice novels. They were non-genre novels that I kind of, back then the Oprah book thing was huge, the Oprah book club. And I kind of, you know, I wrote them with that in mind that, oh, these are going to be those kind of literary um, Oprah book club books. (laughs) And, you know, I was just a newbie at it and I didn't really know what I was doing, but I wrote two novels and they turned out okay. But I just kind of half gave it a half-hearted attempt at getting an agent and trying to go down that route and got a lot of rejection letters. And a lo- and actually, I shouldn't even say a lot. I think I just got a couple because I didn't really try that hard. I didn't really write that many 
agents. And back then it was snail mail trying to get an agent. So I would send these letters out and then I would walk to my mailbox and go and check the mail. And back then you had to send your SASE, your self-address stamped envelope. It was terrible. If you can remember those days. Yeah. And then you had to copy, you had to make so many copies because they wanted some sample pages. And yeah. And then of course, if they were decent, they mailed them back to you. And, right. you did, and then you could send them to another agent. And if not, let me, let me ask you yeah. this though, because you're talking about the, those first two novels and, and how you, you know they were non-genre. And at this point, I want to uh, I want to welcome our our listeners to the conversation. Obviously, I'm with Christine Carbo. Uh, she's a Montana writer in the tradition of Jim Harrison and Thomas McGuane and people like that. And maybe she'll have as big a name as Jim Harrison and Thomas McGuane someday. But you started with those first two novels. Uh, that were non-genre, literary, looking for the Oprah Book Club, like like anybody would be. Uh, but my question is, did you become a genre writer? Was it a calculated decision because you knew that it was easier to sell and to build an audience and you wanted to be a successful writer in that sense? Or did was that just something that you were really tapped into? You suddenly decided, I love suspense, and that's all I'm going to write about is suspense and the great outdoors. Well, um, it's a great question. I, and that's kind of where I was heading when I was saying that I had wanted I wanted to do this Oprah Book Club book, and I life kind of just happened to me after that. And I gave up the whole endeavor, honestly, and I quit writing for over a decade. And I went through a divorce and went into survival mode as a single mom and just um, started doing, uh, I worked for a community college teaching English part-time and, you know, no benefits and poor pay and, just decided this isn't cutting it. So then I started doing a lot of copywriting, which was, you know, no offense to all the copywriters who love copywriting out there, but I did um, more of the technical end of it. And I, it was very monotonous. And I did, you know, I did that solely just to make money. And I just didn't have time at the end of the day to be back on the keyboard to write creative fiction when I was, you know, teaching, grading papers, and then doing copywriting uh, for the rest, you know, late into the evening when, when I could be home with my little boy. And so I took over a decade of a break. And when I came back to creative writing and, you know, honestly, I didn't think I ever would. I remember telling a friend, I'm not doing this. This writing thing is not for me. You know, I'm, I'm, I was thinking about those rejection letters and how hard it was and, you know, being very insecure about the whole process. And when I got these, you know, rejection letters, they were just crushing to me, even though I didn't try, like I said, that hard, they were crushing for me. And that's a whole other, another story why they were so crushing to me. And I'd love to share that with you too, but let me finish this train of thought. So I ended up saying, when I got back to it after a number of years, my friend did say to me, just you wait, you won't be able to quit forever. This little voice will come back to you that says you need to write. If you're truly a writer, Christine, this little voice will bug you eventually it didn't happen for about 10 years, but when it did, it came on strong and it said, you really need to write. And part of the reason the, this little voice came to me that I really needed to get back to writing was because I was reading mystery novels and they were so great. I mean, I just love the fact that I was turning pages and I was feeling like, you know, reading Dennis Lehane and Tana French and, you know, these, all these writers who just, they, it felt really literary to me. And I always kind of assumed that the genre thing, because, you know, the, the eras that I grew up in with fiction, that, you know, those were, those weren't, they were looked upon a little differently than the literary novel. And when I came back to it all those years later, I thought these are not different from literary novels at all. I mean, you know, these, you know, James Lee Burke, the, and you mentioned Thomas McGuane, and, you know, these, these are really, wonderful novels with, they just, they have the suspense element, but in my opinion, all novels have a suspense element because even if they're not crime fiction, you still want to keep turn the pages because you want to know what happens to that character. So every novel, in my opinion, is written with the idea that you're going to keep your reader turning the pages and that the suspense is there for, 
what happens, even if there's no crime involved. However, the additional added crime made it even that much more suspenseful for me. And so I just decided that that passion that I was dis- rediscovering fit hand in hand with my passion to get back to writing. And so, no, to answer your question, it wasn't a kind of business move like the, you know, maybe I'll get an agent more easily if I write genre, maybe I'll get published more easily. It wasn't that. It was literally just, it just went hand in hand with my passion for getting back to writing at that particular time in my life. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the reason I ask is even genre writers, you'll see them go off on the side and they write, even sometimes under a different name, and they write something that's literary. Uh, the, The thing with genre, although it can be very literary, is that you keep revisiting the same subject. It is detective or it is um, a law room drama or law, uh, courtroom drama and so on. Right. And there's a, and if you want to strike out and do something that's about God knows what, a college, uh, you know, a, a college campus and a, and a college professor uh, who's at a crossroads in his or her life, then uh, that's off the beaten path. And now it's something entirely different. It may not work under your name. It might work under under a pseudonym or what have you. But I got to say, there you are in Montana. There are some big name Montana writers. There also, I love the name of your novel, A Sharp Solitude. It immediately reminded me of Desert Solitaire by Edward Abbey, which is a great memoir about being outdoors and that, that's Utah, not Montana, but being outdoors in, in the, um, just the validity of being alone, the, the benefits of being alone and being in nature and, uh, the best company a man can have, as he puts it, you know, in the end, the best company a man can have is his own company, uh, and so on. And, and, and with the wild animals and all that, and, and, uh, that came to mind when I saw that title. So, Christine Carbo, talking to our listeners again, she's the author of, and she'll correct me on anything I get wrong here, four novels, A Sharp Solitude is One, The Wild Inside, The Weight of Night, and Mortal Fall. Did I leave anything out other than your two literary novels from the beginning? No, no. Those are the four books that are on the shelves. Now, what about those literary novels? Is that, would you ever dust off those manuscripts, rewrite them, and not necessarily for the, for the genre, I'm just saying rewrite them and put them back out there? Or is that something that's, those were, um, what do you call them, trial novels or practice novels, and you, you moved on, and, and they shall never see the light of day? Yeah, I think that's the case. I feel, I get this question a lot, and I'm not going to, um, I don't want to say never. And, but right now it doesn't feel like the kind of thing I want to do to go back to those. And honestly, I don't even know how to find them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they are on some old hard drive, you know, and at, you, you, all the years go by and you do stuff with your computer equipment and, you know, the, the technology changes and the zip drives change to, you know, thumb drives. And I, you know, back then I think we had, I was saving on floppy disks. And so I, I don't know that I could even figure out how to access those, to be honest, which is kind of sad, but, um, but if I figured out a way and could go back to them, I'm not even sure I would want to rework them. So you, um, also spent time, you've lived an interesting life. I mean, your parents uprooted you, but you fell in love with Montana. You're there now. You've got children. I believe uh, you went through a divorce, but you're married again now. I'm not even sure of that, but yes, you spent um, time as a- f- We have a combined family and um, part of remarrying and kind of figuring my life out a little bit was what was, you know, and allowed me to get back to writing. And I think to hear, to get back in touch with the whole creative writing endeavor to, you know, to have a supportive partner and, and to not feel like I was in survival mode all the time. And, and to be able to, you know, take a, to sit back a little and, and take a breather, not that having a combined family wasn't challenging and very time consuming as well, but I just mean that extra support financially, emotionally, 
really helped for me to be able to get back to the writing endeavor. Well, you spent time as a flight attendant for Delta Airlines. You got your I private did. pilot's license at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University in Prescott, a, a, a place I've spent quite a bit of time in. And uh, do you still have your pilot license today? Well, the funny thing about a pilot li- pilot's license is that you always have it. It never goes away. But if you're not current, then you cannot fly. And I am not current. So I still have the license, but I would have to go back and retake some instruction and some flying lessons and whatnot to get current again. So um, has there been a pilot, been, a private pilot in any of your novels? No, there since has you not. Know so much of, oh, but well, okay, not a bad idea. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, since you know so much about it, you can certainly, you can certainly pull that off. Talk about your approach to suspense. I mean, uh, suspense is not an easy thing to create. I mean, one of the, I think, issues that a lot of agents have with uh, writers out there is that they're not creating the suspense that's uh, that's uh, required to keep a reader engaged in turning pages. Right. It's, it's um, challenging, really challenging. And sometimes it kind of just flows and you feel like you've got the muse on your side and things just work out. And other times it doesn't feel that way. And I have to work extremely hard to try and figure out how do my, how do I create suspense? Which plot direction should I go in? What, what choices should I make here? And sometimes it, I get, a little psyched out by it all. And I have trouble making those decisions. And, um, and honestly, the longer that I write and the more experience I get with it, it actually becomes a little bit harder, not easier. I think the, the, the less I knew in the beginning, the more I could just fly by the seat of my pants and just wing it and go with it and feel like, yeah, I'll try this and I'll try that and kind of be a free spirit about it. And now that I know, you know, and I've, read so much suspense at this point, because when I started it, I hadn't even read that much suspense. I mean, when I say I love suspense, it wasn't like I'd been reading it my entire life. I hadn't, I wasn't a youngster reading Agatha Christie and Sherlock Holmes and all this stuff. I picked it up later in life, which is this, this newfound passion that I was speaking about. And so when I decided that I really loved it, I had a lot of catching up to do. And now, you know, um, that it's a number of years later since I put the Wild Inside Out, that was 2015 when it came out. I have, you know, done so much more reading in the genre and know how many choices there are for roads that you can go down to create suspense. And it starts to get a little daunting. Like, you know, the more choices you have, the more decisions you have to make. And the more decisions you have to make, it's it's like, I could go wrong. I could make the wrong decision. And then I could spend pages and pages and pages. I mean, literally hundreds of pages. And I could have really made the wrong plot decision. And so it gets a little overwhelming for me. And the best thing I can do to tackle that is just, I don't know, um, try and quiet those voices that, you know, so what, if I make a wrong decision, it's not the end of the world to go back and revise and change these things. And, um, you know, that's just part of being a professional in the business. It, it has to be done when it has to be done. And sometimes you have to go back and rewrite major plot points. And that's, that's just the name of the game and, you know, take a deep breath and get to work. So, um, so yeah, that, that's, kind of part of the, the the process, but in terms of actual suspense, actually creating suspense, which is, I believe, more of what your reader or your listeners are interested in what, you know, is addressing your question is that, you know, it's, it's very difficult to answer, but for me, it's a combination of setting, psychology, and And when I say psychology, I mean like my character's emotions, like what really is the Mm -hmm. emotional content of my characters and how does that pit up against the setting and other characters within that setting? And I'd say those are the, the big factors and also history. 
So what are your, what are the things that push the buttons for your character? And usually in my mind, not always, it is about trauma and childhood trauma. And I know that that's a little overused these days, this whole, you know, flashback to childhood trauma and, you know, what is it, what were the pinnacle things in a child's life that created, you know, their situation in the present time so that the case they're investigating, you know, causes them discomfort. And then that that discomfort often causes the suspense, right? And so that, you know, one could argue, and I think there was a big article in the New Yorker not too long ago about that being a trope, this idea that we're going to tap back into childhood trauma and that, you know, that it's so overused, you know, these days that we always have this kind of pause button that we say, okay, hold on reader while, you know, not just with reading, with watching too, where we, you know, hold on, let's explain, you know, let's go back and flash back to this person's childhood to understand why, why they're reacting this way in the present time. And so, I'm, a, you know, I'm aware that that is a little bit overused. However, I do really think it's highly effective. You know, I really, really believe that so much of who we are, not just because of fiction or movies or whatever, but who we really are in real life. I mean, that's why we go to therapy sometimes because it involves, you know, all those building blocks that were created when we were young and the wounds and the successes and the failures and the, you know, the discomforts that we experience and the ways that we protected ourselves or created bad habits or good habits in order to, you know, to get by and survive. And those things are super fascinating to me. And they're super fascinating and interesting for me to develop and figure out with new characters that I choose. And those characters then are pitted against, you know, their setting or the case that they're involved in. And I think it's Michael Connolly who has that quote that, you know, um, I'll probably butcher the quote, but it's something to the effect that it's not the case that the detective is working. It's how the case works. The detective that's very, you know, that's so interesting. Mm. And Mm. I really do believe that it's like, you could have a pretty uninteresting murder situation you know, somebody pushes somebody off a cliff or, you know, somebody drowns in a river or somebody, you know, is found, is found dead in their apartment. It, you know, th- these are not like mind blowing kind of crimes. Right. But it's how it's, it's the whole setting and the whole scenario and the whole dynamic between the detective and what's going on when they are trying to figure out what's going with what, what's gone down and how that plays on their emotions, if you're in your detective's head, how that plays with their emotions, that's going to propel the story forward as well. So it's, it's a lot, it's kind of a lot of stuff, but it's, you know, that's key for me. Well, what role does nature in the outdoors play in your books? You're obviously an outdoors person, or you certainly come off as an outdoors person uh, in your bio. Uh, what role uh, do you see? the wonders of nature or just the outdoors, whether they're wonderful or not, as, as almost like another player in the drama? I do. Um, I see the setting as um, a character of its own. And I feel like setting sometimes is a little bit ignored in some books. But for me, there's just no way to do that. And where I live the setting is so dominant and so commanding that in my writing, it's impossible for me to ignore it. Now, with that said, I don't want every single one of my books in my life. And I don't want to feel like I'm tied down, like you were talking about genre earlier and how, you know, you, maybe you get roped into just writing one type of novel. If, if that's, the path you choose and what, you know, what your fans expect, what your readers expect, maybe what your publishing company expects, maybe what your agent expects. But at the same time, you know, a lot of writers would like the creative freedom to try different things and maybe set their stories in different places. Perhaps they want to set it, you know, in a city somewhere and, and not have 
quite the the wild setting that I have, uh, you know, that I've been writing my books around. However, I do feel like even if I were to write a novel in Seattle or LA or New York City, um, I, I probably wouldn't choose those places. Well, I have lived in Seattle, but I probably wouldn't choose LA or New York City because I haven't lived there. And I do feel like setting, you have to have a little bit of an intimate relationship with setting in order to do it justice. However, I do feel that as a writer, we should be free to write in different places. I mean, it shouldn't just be, you know, where we live or where we feel like we know the best. We should, you know, be able to move around. And I, and I want the freedom to do that just as much as any other writer out there. And I don't want to feel like I always have to just deliver the certain brand of, you know, of fiction, which, you know, is about the wild. But with that said, I am uh, an outdoorsy person and I do love it. And I do feel like setting plays a big role in my stories. And I don't know. I mean, we, I'd have to see if setting play, you know, if I tried to write a book set in a city somewhere, if it would come across the same way, that same feeling, I suspect it wouldn't have quite the same power that the setting does in my four books that are out there. However, I do feel like I would think about setting quite a bit. Because that's well, your readers process. could be disappointed too. Because I mean, it's like Carl Heisen writing a, a, a novel that's not set in Florida. It's like, wait mm -hmm. a minute, we love all the all the scumbag uh, politicians and business people in Florida that, that that you write about. Now you're not in Florida anymore. Uh, you, you're identified very much with your locale, so uh, your writers could end up being being uh, your readers could end up being disappointed anyway. Uh, let True. me ask you, what obsesses True. you? Well, you know, all those things we're talking about, a, a good book, <laughs> a great mystery, a great suspense novel, you know, a beautiful hike, uh, a, a great camping trip, um, psychology, emotions, conflict, all, you know, all those things that humans, those things all, you know, I, I really love to read about those things. I really love to explore those things. I like to experience nature and the beauty of nature. So all those things are kind of about who I am. And that's why so much of that comes, comes out on the page. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you think the turning point was in your life as a writer? Now, I know that, that you got some breathing space when you had a partner in life, you got remarried and that just, just, you know, in terms of mechanically, it, it opened up your life a little bit to where you had the time to write. But in the act of writing, as you as you write uh, and have written over the years, was there a turning point? Was there was there something that happened or a stage you hit where you felt like, ah, I finally feel like I'm in the channel? Um, well, you know, it's I would say I mean, you did say it gets harder. It actually gets harder as you go along, which has got to be discouraging to a lot of people. But, you know, having done it for so many years myself, I do know it. it's not like it gets a whole lot easier. Uh, you so you come know up what with I mean? Strategy. Yeah. 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 I mean, you come up with certain strategies for dealing with things, but it doesn't get a whole lot easier. It still is a lot of work. You yeah. have to you have to love what you're the process or there's just no point in doing it because it will basically bury you in anxiety and self-doubt and so on. Correct. Correct. And I think a lot of my process was getting through some of that self-doubt and through. So as for a turning point, um, I think there were several. So I have this interesting history, in my opinion, it's interesting because I don't think it's the trajectory that a lot of authors take. And that's that I had this approach avoidance thing with books for a long time, because when I was in the third grade, my teacher told me that I couldn't read. And um, back back in those days, I was going to school in a little elementary school in Florida, Gainesville, Florida, Glen Springs Elementary. And I had a teacher who, um, I think a lot of teachers just, this is this was just the paradigm for teaching back then, was to make kids stand up and, you know, recite their times tables or read a page or a paragraph or whatever. And, and the teacher would point at you in the room and say, hey, you, what's nine times seven? Stand up. What's six times eight? You, what's four times ten? You know, I mean, really quickly. And you'd have to just, you'd have to do it quickly. And, or you stand up and read this paragraph. And I was extremely shy as a little girl, like very shy. I was kind of the 
kid that was hiding behind my mom's skirts and peeking out behind them. And that style of learning just wasn't really good for me. And so when I was asked to stand up and read in front of the class, I would not be able to do that. And so they called my folks in and said, you know, we'd like to hold your daughter back. And this was in third grade. And my dad said, well, you know, I don't think that she needs to be held back. I think that she's just very shy. And so they did not hold me back and I went on, but that little voice stayed with me forever. That voice that said that I could not read. And I got to the point where I would just avoid books for a long time because I felt like, you know, I I was almost a little afraid of them. I would look at them and go, well, you know, I can't read. And then because I thought I couldn't read, I felt stupid because of course not reading. I mean, reading is the key to so many things, just knowledge and intelligence. Key to learning, yeah, absolutely. It's the key to learning, even math. You know, I mean, you get a math textbook and you have to read how to do it. So I felt very kind of shamed around that and insecure for a long time. And of course, eventually I worked through it. But I think it's interesting that my degree, I have a master's in linguistics, in English linguistics. And I think it's interesting that that's the route I went when I had this weird, strange relationship with books. And so I was not an extremely well-read youngster. I was not confident. In fact, I I watched a podcast um, with another author not too long ago who said, who was saying, and then it was exactly the same grade. It was third grade. And she said that she loved her third grade teacher and she credits her, that was her turning point in her life for becoming an author because her third grade teacher encouraged her to write. And was so loving and current. And I'm not saying my third grade teacher wasn't loving, but mm, probably not. And, you know, she, she didn't give any encouragement. It was very, you know, a very um, disappointing experience. And it really, speaking of childhood trauma, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I don't want to be overly dy- um, dramatic about it, but it, it did affect me on this subtle level. And for a long time, I don't even think I understood that until I became an adult to look back on it. Like, why, you know, is this writing process so difficult? And, you know, why do I even want to write when, you know, that little voice was still inside of me? Like, well, you can't read. Why do you want to write? Well, it makes no sense. It's another, it's another form of procrastination too, is the, geez, this is so hard. Why am I doing it? Yeah. It's another way that the mind kind of plays uh, uh, tricks on us. Yes. Tricks. Exactly. And so I had to work through all of those. And I think part of what helped me do that was a great teacher who I discovered after college when I was teaching at my um, a local community college in the Flathead Valley. And I l- was looking through a catalog one day and it said, you know, you take this course, how to write a novel. <laughs> or it was like, write the first pages of your novel or something like that. I can't remember the title, but I showed up for that. And all you had to do was write the first 30 pages of your novel. And it, at the time, it seemed really daunting, 30 pages, but I did it. And then I wrote another 30 and I wrote another 30 and another 30. And eventually it took me four years, but eventually I had that first novel, one of those, you know, the, the, the ones we spoke about earlier, the non-genre novel. And I had this novel and then I thought, well, I'll write another. So I wrote another. And this one, that one took me two years. And I thought, well, great. I've got two novels now. Maybe I'll take this writing thing more seriously and I'll try and get an agent. And by then I had taken part in some writers groups that I had met through um, being involved in that class and, and getting to know that teacher who was very encouraging. And, you know, you, I think you have to develop a community and that really helped me. But then the divorce happened. And as I already spoke about that, but I took that hiatus for over 10 years after those first two books. And so I, even though I had that one turning point, it wasn't quite enough. So when I came back to it, um, I think the turning point for me was just being older and more mature and having worked through some of those insecurity issues and getting that voice out of my head about the, you can't read. I mean, obviously I could read. I had a, I have a master's degree in English. And so, you know, it's just kicking those tricks out of the head a little bit. And when coming back to it and being very deliberate and choosing to write crime. So, you know, even though it wasn't a business decision, it was a deliberate decision. I'm going to write what I like to read, you know, and that's crime fiction. And so being deliberate about it, one of the other things I was deliberate about was, okay, writers groups are vital and important and they helped me with my first two novels that I didn't do anything with. 
but I'm not going to use them right now. I made a conscious choice to not use writer's groups at that point. And I'm not saying this is for everybody, but it was for me at that point because I thought I'm coming back to this very deliberately to enter this world of crime fiction. And I just want to do what I'm going to do. And I just want to play with it. And I don't want to go and get everything critiqued and turn down and second guess everything because that's not where I'm at right now. And so I get get that. Let's talk about that a little bit because, you know, when the the nice thing about a writer's group is there is camaraderie there and and you can commiserate and celebrate and so on. But on the other hand, you listen to people critiquing and one person is telling you something completely opposite from another. And then you have to wonder what, what value is this if somebody is really sending me in opposite directions. That's just two people I'm talking about. But, you know, you can be given innumerable pieces of advice that drive. And then pretty soon it gets right back to this whole thing of, I don't enjoy this. I want to write what I write. I want to write what I feel. I mean, Philip Roth, uh, what he was our greatest living novelist until recently when he died. And he just said, I write what I write. And if people like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. This is who I am. And that's what I'm going to write. And of course, exactly. for him, it was it, it worked out incredibly well. But um, I think too often writers get all wrapped up in this whole idea that what does this person think? What and also, you know, I never think it's a good idea to show people you know your writing because they already know too much about you. It's like an actor being on a screen. The really brilliant actors a lot of times try to stay out of the public limelight. Because they say, I can't, can't sell myself on the screen if everybody identifies me with who I really am and they, they know me too well. Ditto for writing. I mean, I just think it's like, that doesn't sound like you. Well, it's not supposed to sound like me because that's a character I'm writing. <laughs> right. And he happens to be male, you know, or yeah, female. Yes, exactly. Or, or yeah. female, right. what have yeah. you. <laughs> but I did want to talk to you about the writer's groups because I'm, I'm not dissing writer's groups. There is, in, in your case, you needed the company of other writers. It's a lonely profession. At the it's first a lonely turning point in my life, I did. And then with the second turning point, no, I didn't. And I And I'm very glad that I figured that out because I felt like, I really, it was very vital to me. Now I am actually with a writer's group again because I'm in a different spot now. And I feel like that, how we talked about things getting a little more difficult, like, okay, now I know more. Now there's more choices and, and I want people to bounce things off of. And that's one yeah, of the wheels the that good, I deal talk with about that the good things. choices. Yeah, yeah. So sorry to interrupt, but talk about the good things writer's groups do since I just trashed them. Yeah, no, and don't apologize for interrupting. So, I mean, this is, this is your interview. So I think that you have to know what kind of writer you are, what, what your goal is with your writer's group, and that's what's going to make it successful or not. And if it's not successful, don't be afraid to drop out of it. So, you know, either you have the, the kinds of people that are the kinds of writers that get that you're different from their writing and people aren't trying to, in the group, aren't trying to change, you know, aren't going, well, you know, you need a lot more, like, for example, me, I, I might be the kind of person that says, I think you need more emotion. I think you need more psychological elements. And maybe that's not the writer that they are. I need to realize that about their writing. I need to realize that's, that's not their shtick. That's not, how they do it. And I need to appreciate how they do it and vice versa. They need to quit taking the emotion out of my story if that's not their thing. So that you really have to have a respect for the other people in your group, a respect for what they're writing. You have to realize that you can't just try to make their writing like yours and they can't just try and make your writing like theirs. Now, with that said, you certainly want to learn from each other and give each other advice. So, you know, you just, it, it, it either gels or it doesn't, and you need to not be afraid to get out of the group. If, if it doesn't, if it does, it can be super important. And part of the reason it's important for me at this point with the writer that I am is not so much line editing or submit a scene, you know, it's, it's, I'm really kind of, I don't, want that or need that. I mean, maybe occasionally I, I like to bounce ideas, plot ideas. Um, maybe I do want to submit a scene to say, Hey, do I, 
do I have the suspense? I mean, is this suspenseful? Did you feel any suspense? Because we lose track of that too. I mean, that was one of your questions earlier. How do you create that suspense? Part of it is getting feedback. Is it, is it suspenseful? And, you know, again, one reader in your group might say no. And another group say, I thought yes. And then you have to deal with that. Okay. One says no, one says yes. And then you have to figure out, well, what can I do that the person who says no is saying to add to, to, to it, to make it even better for that person without destroying what it is I did that made the other reader happy and made myself happy when I wrote mm-hmm. this. And so it's just, yeah, it's just using your well, judgment. That's I the think. thing is keeping but it your you, own. Do you have time? Do you have the time and energy for that is the question at, at your point and time in your process of writing. And sometimes I would, think yes and sometimes no and don't be afraid to just say no to writers groups because people will come ask you if you want to be part of their group too and sometimes you just have to say no that's not where I am right now and sometimes yeah you know actually I think that would be good for me so or sometimes you ignore the advice because it's it's like you know that piece of advice would you know it doesn't have to be spoken it just needs to be ignored that's not my voice it would destroy my voice because I'm trying to serve so many masters here that um Absolutely. It's impossible. And then I'm going to Absolutely. serve nobody. It's just going to degrade my voice or the character's voice or the scene that and this is these are the signature scenes that I write. And that's that's just the way it is. And, you know, you can't take the joy out of your own writing and expect to succeed. It just isn't it's not going to happen. I don't know anybody who who uh, has succeeded by taking their voice and diminishing it. No. Um, yeah. And you and I do think you're correct that our voices do can get diminished if we're around the wrong feedback. Yeah. So we take the good, or we take not the good feedback, but the constructive, constructive in the sense that, wow, uh, I like what you said about you take a scene, perhaps. So you're taking a microcosm of the, of the novel. You take in that scene and they might make suggestions of adding an element to the scene that that makes it better which is great um, but otherwise we just ignore the advice that does not resonate with us and but we look for the opportunities for the advice that's additive to to the the to the text or to our our process or what have you what is the greatest compliment you've ever received from one of your readers can you think of, of, of a compliment you've received that you cherish the most Oh, you know, it's, it's, it's so lovely to get compliments, you know, to get emails from fans and to hear people that say that, you know, that I've brought something for one, one woman wrote me and said that she lived over in Germany, but she was, and she was feeling really disconnected from nature and from just her sense of the things that she used to love as a child with getting out into the wilderness and getting out with her parents and hiking and all that. And she expressed how my books were able to vicariously bring that to her. She was in Berlin and she just was feeling like she was really disconnected from it. And she felt like she was able to vicariously kind of be reconnected with that. And that was a really powerful compliment for me because I felt that, you know, that's very cool that you not only, I mean, my first tip is to, yeah, get out into nature because it's awesome and there's nothing better. But if, if reading can get you halfway there or (laughs) that's, that's a really cool compliment for me. And then another compliment that I got um, a number of years ago was from an author named David Morell, who actually wrote First Blood, oh, yeah. which was made into yeah. Rambo. That's right. And he had given me a he had emailed me and gave me a great compliment where he was comparing me to, and he was a PhD in English himself and actually taught uh, quite a bit of English at the college level, at the university level. And he had um, mentioned to me that my writing kind of re- reminded him of you know, he, he listed off several great authors and I was, you know, I was just so shocked by I that. Could. Do you well, remember any of them? You know, from the past, actually, um, Henry James. And I was oh, like, wow. I was like, <laughs> are you kidding? And okay. I, yeah. And so that was, just are you the, messing with me? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, that's such it a was compliment. just an awesome compliment, and it was so needed at that point in my life because I was struggling a little bit with with I was actually struggling a little bit with a sharp solitude with having it all come together, and I felt like okay, that just gave me permission to go ahead and just be the author that I am. Because, you know, in the suspense world, sometimes it's like, oh, it's too flowery. It's too literary. There's too much description. You need to take, take this out. Or maybe you need to too do that. hard-boiled. Maybe too it's, hard-boiled. Or too hard-boiled. Or, yeah, too this, too that. Like, it's going back to the writer's group discussion. You know, that can, even if you're not part of a writer's group, you can get that from readers, or you can get that from the publishing industry, or you can get that from your editor or your agent, or, you know. And so it is this fine tightrope that you have to uh, walk of still being the writer that you are, but not, you know, being boring or not suspenseful because you're including too much setting or because you're including things that aren't, you know, that are losing the reader's interest. And so I, um, I, I felt, it felt great to get a compliment that, you know, just appreciated the writer that I was and that helped me plow forward as well. Major, major. Yeah. So I don't remember if I asked you to do this or, or not, but do you have an excerpt you can read from one of your novels so our listeners can get a sense of, of your voice and uh, the kind of writing that you do? Did I ask you to prepare something? You asked me to pick something out, and I did pick something out. And um, it's Which actually novel? it's from A Sharp Solitude, and it's actually one of my... It's about two minutes long. Do we maybe maybe two minutes and a few seconds over? Do we have time for that? Oh yeah, yeah, no problem. Go right ahead. Okay, um, so this is from, like I said, a sharp solitude. This is my fourth book, and it came out in 2018. And um, I have I'm the the novel flip flops back and forth between two main characters, a female and a male. And the female is an FBI agent who is in a resident local office here in the Flathead. And the male is somebody that she used to be involved with, and she has a son with this person. And he's a wildlife biologist who has a dog who he goes out into the woods with and um, gets information by this dog. He's a scent dog. He's kind of like a cadaver dog, only he finds scent from, you know, anything from moose to grizzly bears to, you know, bats to any, you know, he's, he can be trained to find the scent so that they can do wildlife biology research. So anyway, um, I'm going to pick, I'm going to read a little section with him. Mm -hmm. His name is Reeve and, um, yeah, we'll go from there. So Reeve present Thursday. When I think of Anne Marie, my mind doesn't linger for long on the smooth top feel of her body the way she softly giggled when we kissed and how I could feel the corners of her mouth turning upward in a smile when I placed my lips on hers. Nor does it stay on the image of her braid falling against my mouth as she lay on top of me and how I desperately bit down on it. Instead, my mind wanders back to the hike earlier in the day. Out among the exquisite beauty of midfall, I think of how I felt oddly cheery and connected to everything for a change, almost as if I were a young kid again and could be wholly present caught up in the joy of any given moment. Don't get me wrong. It's not as if I don't appreciate my environment on a regular basis. Quite the opposite. I'm obviously very used to being in the woods because of my job, which demands I hike miles of wilderness nearly every day of the week, especially in the spring, summer, and fall months. In the winter, I still go, but not as far, because although I can snowshoe and ski, McKay can't cover excessive mileage in the deep snow. The allure of its power is one of the reasons I came to Montana, me along with a whole host of people who sense that the great jutting presence of the landscape has the magnetic influence to pull your attention away from mind-numbing quotidian routines, that it can lead you back to what's real. But for me, it's more than that. I figured the woods of the Northwest could connect me to whatever remained of my unencumbered self and would tether me securely to some hitching post of existence. But yesterday, I could have sworn I was aware of it in a different way, life's intricacies surrounding me in a more integrated manner, the high soaring ravens, the leaves cushioning my steps, the wispy clouds in the pale blue sky, the mosaic of dark jade and coppery colors on the slopes, the breezes making the aspen leaves quiver, the shape of Anne-Marie's lightly freckled cheekbones when she looked down to take her notes. 
all of it seemed to be part of a grand design that I was acutely conscious of and more important, deeply part of. Because even though I'm out in the wild daily, it's rare for me to, to be long. Usually I am an observer, not a participant, as if I watch the wilderness and life happening around me from a faraway place, from another dimension. But with Anne-Marie, the details seemed to reveal all of the complexities and layers that I'd been missing out on. But I was a fool. It was only an age-old spell, attraction. It had absolutely nothing to do with nature and everything to do with a sexy woman. So that scene goes on, and you kind of get back into his head where he is with some police detectives. Yeah, in, very in, in, vivid in an interrogation you- room. So that's kind of a sample of how I pull in the nature, but I didn't, I didn't want to go too far over, you know, two and a, two and a half minutes, but if I would have oh, continued no, no that scene, we would have been, I guess my point is that, you know, I mean, that descriptive writing is part of my writing, but then, and you, you definitely know, get a sense of place. You yeah. Definitely and get a, sense a sense of place, place, but then right off the next thing, I'm going to go into dialogue so that, so that it's the whole scene isn't that way either. Cause I don't want, I, I want that balance between dialogue and description. Of so, course. Yeah. Of course. What are you working on now? Are you working on novel number five? Do you already have a concept uh, or are you, yeah, so, how far along are you? And not, not to, I understand superstition sometimes with writers and, and obviously you don't want to give the whole thing away, but uh, can you give us a sketch? Yeah. So um, let me just say this. I, I, this A Sharp Solitude came out in 2018. I took some time off and then I began writing a fifth novel. And I wrote a novel, an entire novel that I struggled and struggled and struggled with. And this is the part where I say it became more difficult. (laughs) I was really Mm -hmm. having a tough time. And I ended up getting to the point where I just decided that this novel, this fifth novel I wrote is not the one I want to put on the shelves right now. And so I'm not saying never, but it is, I have decided to put that novel aside. I might come back to it at some point, but not right now. And I have, I have started another novel and that's where I'm at right now. And this novel is still pretty new. And I actually don't think I want to talk about it just yet too much, Mm -hmm. but it does take place here, but it is, my series is what I call an ensemble series. The one that, um, involves the four books that you mentioned and that for me that means that i take a my main character plays through his entire or her entire character arc and so what what i do is i pluck a side character similar to tana french in her dublin murder mystery series and i pluck a side character and bring that character forward in the second book mortal fall and then i pluck a, a secondary character from that book and bring that character for yeah. in the weight of night. And then um, Interesting. I bring that side, another side character forward into a sharp solitude who happens to be that FBI detective that I was talking about. And, or so, or agent, I should say. And she's the main character. She's, she makes a side appearance in the weight of night. She's the main character in a sharp solitude. So they don't have to be read in order, but they're kind of fun if you do, because you see them as side characters first, and then you can come forward with them when, when they play through their entire character arc in that book. And the reason I chose an, an, on, an ensemble series is because I just didn't feel like I wanted to be with one character over and over and over again for yes. book after book. It's not that I don't love that kind of writing. I honestly didn't know if I could. I had that insecurity around that. Could, can I actually take one character and make them interesting for book after book after book? And I wasn't sure that I could. So I didn't want to do that at that point. I'm not saying I'll never do that, but I didn't want to do it when I dove into the crime fiction writing world. And so one of the other things that this has allowed me to do is by not having a series, one series character, is it also allows me to break away from the ensemble series and write a book that it doesn't pluck a side character, just has its own character. And so that's what I'm doing with this book that I'm writing. I am not plucking a side character from one of those four books. You know, I am just starting with um, a, f- a fresh new character and it's still set in this area, but I feel like it's um, a little less setting involved, which, you know, yeah, I might disappoint some fans, but I, I, that's just where I'm at. 
So or, that's what I'm yeah, doing. or it could be bracing, you know, it could be bracing for them or, and it may bring in some new people. Um, you're Correct. following your instincts, which I think is, is critical. So what is, if somebody wants to start at the beginning, as you were saying, it's kind of fun from the beginning because the side characters, you see them uh, move to front stage along yeah. the way. What was your first one? Where would somebody start? So the first one was called The Wild Inside. The Wild Inside. Yeah. Okay. And it involves and it a lead detective from the Department of the Interior who is called from Denver offices to come to Glacier, which is federal land under the federal ju jurisdiction of the Department of the Interior, and to investigate a pretty serious crime that takes place there. Um, however, he's kind of freaked out about being in Glacier because when he was a teen, he witnessed his father get mauled and killed by a grizzly bear when he was camping there as a youngster. And so he's a little bit haunted by Glacier. And, you know, instead of it being this really wonderful vacation-y place to be, it's a little daunting and um, stark for him and a little, uh, yeah, a, a little haunting for him to be mm -hmm in the setting of Glacier. And I really wanted to bring that out in the setting, how desolate Glacier Park can be. And I think I achieved that. And so then I pull a side character, kind of a sidekick of his, his name is Monty. And he's the main character in my second book, it's called Mortal Fall. And then there's a side character in both The Wild Inside Mortal Fall, her name is Gretchen. And she's a forensic scientist actually. And she's the main character in the third book, called The Weight of Night. And Monty's actually I bring forward as well as a secondary. I, and so they both actually share the spotlight. Monty and Gretchen share the spotlight in The Weight of Night. And then in The Weight of Night, Allie is introduced and she's this FBI agent because there's an abduction of a child from one of the campgrounds. And so um, with a kidnapping, the feds get involved. And so she is involved and she is brought forward into a sharp solitude. And she used to be involved with the character I just read the section, his name is Reeve. And um, she uh, has a child with Reeve. And so the, the woman, Anne Marie that I mentioned is a different woman because they're no longer together. But um, uh, she, yeah, she's the main character in A Sharp Solitude. And, and Reeve is also a, a, another main character. So two main characters. So let's uh, finish with you giving uh, to the listeners, what's your best piece of writing advice or what advice would you give the aspiring writer out there? Because you're actually in a place right now that, that they are aspiring to, to get to. So what advice would you give? I mean, you've already given a lot, uh, but I'm saying if you yeah. were to kind yeah. of boil it down to a nutshell, um, is there any one thing that you would um, uh, put forth? Yeah, I think, you know, just to be bullheaded. I mean, I think being, you know, you don't want to be so bullheaded and stubborn that you can't learn and that you can't get better. But I think because I come, I've, I've been very honest about my insecurities, you know, and, but you have to have those turning points that we discussed where you get the strength to do what you need to do, to keep your voice, to keep your passion, to keep your joy, like you said. And so you can't be so insecure that that gets stripped away, but you can't also be so strong and powerful and almighty that you literally ignore every good piece of advice that comes your way for what to do with your writing. And so you need to be able to learn. So you have to strike that balance, I think, between those insecurities and that kind of bullheadedness to just that keeps you going and to keep you finding joy in your writing. And so honor your insecurities, but still be bullheaded. If that makes sense, you got to do both. You got to hold them it in does. both hands. You got to, you got to figure out a way to balance them. And, and, and yeah, it's not easy. And some, and you have to recognize that sometimes you will, you will, you will get more weighted down by one than the other. And it's your job as an aspiring writer or even as an accomplished writer to get, figure out how to get back to that balance between, you know, still learning, still achieving, still growing as an author and hearing the things that need to be told to you and being insecure enough to actually make the changes instead of being so bullheaded that you won't even let an a piece of advice in, but forging ahead and finding joy in your writing and doing what you need to do. 
Well, Christine Carbo, we are so glad that your parents wrested you away from Florida and took you to Montana at age 12 (laughs) because it has worked out. As an adult, you still live in Montana. You fall in love with it and you're bringing all kinds of imagery and events out of Montana uh, to the rest of the world with your writing. Thanks a lot for taking the time and, uh, and coming on the program. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed speaking with you and you've got great questions and um, thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you.